Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Can I uh, start by adding my thanks to you for braving the atrocious we weather to get here uh, this evening? Uh, you will have hopefully found on your chair already um, a handout. Um, and I'd just like to say the purpose of this handout is twofold. One, it's a kind of souvenir for you to take away, but it also uh, is a sort of roadmap uh, through uh, the lecture so uh, that you can follow, as it were, where we are at any particular point. You may have heard of the famous uh, story of a 1940s uh, newspaper headline which ran, Fog in the Channel, Continent Cut Off. Now, it may be apocryphal, but it's often referred to because uh, it encompasses, in a very pithy sort of phrase, that long tradition of what has been called British exceptionalism. This is the idea that Britain is not like other <coughs> countries. It's separate from them, and its people are somehow different from all other nations. Advocates of this view point to the fact that the last successful invasion was in 1066. They have a great nostalgia for Britain's imperial past, and they generally think that the British national character is distinctive and different, even proudly eccentric, a little bit like John Cleese in Faulty Towers. If you want to uh, experience a recent celebration of British exceptionalism, you have only to read Jacob Rees-Mogg's recently published book simply called Victorians with its rose-tinted vision of the British Empire bringing civilization to the heathen masses around the world. Now British exceptionalism is a much contested idea but there is one sense in which this country is unarguably exceptional and distinct and that is the extraordinary extent of power, privilege and influence in state-funded education exercised by churches and other religious organisations. Schools with a religious character, or faith schools, represent approximately one-third of all publicly funded schools in this country. And every school is legally required to conduct a daily collective act of worship. On a world scale, this really is exceptional. Countries with much higher levels of religiosity than this one, such as, for example, the United States, do not have such disproportionate religious penetration of their education systems. Furthermore, there are not faith hospitals, faith prisons, faith job centres, or any other type of divided faith-based public service. Why should there be faith schools? The reasons why religion plays such a big part in education are, as has been said already, grounded in history. But in particular, in the last... 75 years, in particular since the passing of the Edu Education Act of 1944, which this uh, lecture commemorates. In its time, the 1944 Act was an extraordinary political uh, achievement, creating a new post-war consensual framework for a more equitable system of schooling. For the first time ever, primary and secondary education would be provided to all free of charge. Now, the historical context uh, in which it emerged was far from encouraging. There were the Depression years of the 1930s and then World War in the 1940s. And throughout the years between the First and the Second World Wars, there had been bitter struggles over education, painfully slow progress, and a widespread view that public education was a drain on the treasury. In 1938, most children, approximately 80%, left school at 14, having only attended an all-age elementary school in which class sizes of 50 were not unusual. The churches controlled over half of all the schools in the country, some 10,553 against the publicly provided sector number of 10,363. Yet the churches had just under 1.4 million pupils, whereas there were 3.15 million in the council schools. The church schools were in many cases smaller and located in rural areas. They were largely funded by historic trusts and parish giving. 
Their managers were perpetually short of funds and the local education authorities had no power over them. Consequently, many of them were in a terrible state of repair and housed in inadequate and dilapidated buildings. The standards of educational achievement were generally low. It was found, for example, that a quarter of wartime conscripts were functionally illiterate. During the Second World War, there emerged a widespread feeling that once it was over, Britain should be a, a better place, a new Jerusalem, as a popular contemporary phrase had it. It was hoped that there would be a more closely knit society reflecting the social solidarity of wartime. There had been an unprecedented mixing of social classes which had broken down the rigid social order. Mass evacuation of children to the countryside had revealed shocking levels of deprivation. The campaign for secondary education for all emerged as a major part of this hope for a better world in the future. At the same time, the Board of Education, which had responsibility for public schooling, found itself adopting a more interventionist role in national planning as a result of managing evacuation, bombing devastation, and other problems associated with wartime. This set the scene for a move to a more recognisably national system of education. Now, the division of responsibility between the churches and the public authorities at the time was known as the dual system, and it had been the subject of controversy for decades. The deplorable state of the non-provided sector, i.e. the church schools, was seen as a national disgrace. However, the task of resolving the issue was replete with intractable difficulties. Civil servants in the Board of Education anguished over means of channeling more public money into the church schools in a way which would be politically acceptable. As far back as the 1902 Balfour Education Act, any idea of using public funds for church schools had provoked huge opposition, expressed, for example, in Lloyd George's phrase, Rome on the rates, referring to taxpayer grants going to Catholic schools. And, of course, the Church of England and the Roman Catholic Church were wary and suspicious of state meddling in their schools. What they wanted, of course, was maximum state funding and minimum state interference. And to complicate matters further, the non-conformist churches, who had very few schools themselves, bitterly resented money being spent on the promotion of the Anglican and Catholic religions. The churches also had legal advantages. The LEAs had no power to close church schools, even where they had spare capacity to replace them. And at the same time, the churches were free to open new schools, even where the LEA was already able to accommodate adequately all the pupils in the area. It had been clear for a long time that this state of affairs was quite unacceptable. The crisis of war threw the situation into sharp relief and brought matters to a head. Into this maelstrom walked an ambitious and politically astute young Conservative MP, Richard Austin Butler. The Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, had made him President of the Board of Education in 1941. Nowadays, he'd be called the Secretary of State for Education. Butler quickly realised that something really radical had to be done. But he knew that it would have to be done carefully, diplomatically and skillfully. There were so many opposing interests at stake. This was a herding cats situation. But he did have the advantage of cross-party support in the wartime national government. His deputy was James Tutor Ede, a Labour politician who was fully on board with what Butler was hoping to do. During 1943, Butler famously spent a fateful weekend at Chequers, where, after a lot of difficult debate and argument, he succeeded in persuading Churchill to support his far-reaching proposals for a fundamental reform of schooling. This had not been an easy task. Churchill had been involved in the earlier wrangling over the dual system and thought that too much time and attention 
spent on educational reform would distract from the war effort, cause controversy and upset the large number of Conservative MPs on whose support he and his war cabinet depended. However, Butler was a consummate politician, and very persuasive, and Churchill yielded. Butler later wrote that when he was called into the great man's presence, I found him in bed, smoking a corona, with a black cat curled up at his feet. He began aggressively by claiming that the cat did more for the war effort than I did. <laughs> Didn't I agree? <laughs> Mustering all his tact, Butler replied, not really, but it is a very beautiful cat. <laughs> After the act was passed, Churchill was gracious. He wrote to Butler saying, pray accept my congratulations. You have won a lasting place in the history of British education. And indeed, in time, the 1944 Act came to be known as the Butler Act in recognition of the absolutely key role he personally played in bringing it about. Providing secondary education for all had then long been the major goal of educational reformers and campaigners. As far back as 1926, the Haddow Report had proposed to abolish the word elementary and to alter and extend the word secondary. We proposed to substitute the word primary but to restrict the use of that term to the period of education which ends at the age of 11 or 12. To the period which follows upon it, we would give the name secondary, and we would make this name embrace all forms of post-primary education. Given this new use of the word secondary, they argued that a new term was needed for the then existing elitist secondary schools, and these, therefore, should henceforth be called by the name of grammar schools. Almost two decades were to elapse before any of this came to pass. Butler's 1944 Act required local education authorities to provide state-funded education up to the age of 15, which incorporated instruction and training as may be desirable in view of pupils' different ages, abilities and aptitudes. This then was the background to the establishment by the 1944 Act of the tripartite system of grammar schools, technical schools and secondary modern schools, although in practice very few technical schools were ever created. In fact, therefore, the system was really bipartite. At the end of primary schooling, children were to be classified according to school records and parental aspirations, with testing being used to supplement the information about each pupil. Eventually, of course, the testing became more important and the phrase, the 11 plus, entered common currency. The grammar schools were the only route to a university education for those who could not afford private schooling. The increasing reliance on testing meant that in the 1950s, a simple so-called test of intelligence left around 80% of children attending secondary modern schools of dubious quality with little or no prospect of higher education. There was supposed to be parity of esteem between the different types of secondary school, but this proved inevitably to be a vain hope. School leaving age was raised to 15, with a clause to raise it subsequently to 16, although this did not happen until the early 70s. Now clearly one of the biggest problems that Buckler faced at that time was persuading the churches to support his plans. Given the control that they exercised over half of the schools and a third of the pupils, they were in a strong position. If they objected, Buckler knew that Churchill would not want any confrontation with them for the reasons that I've already discussed. And this might then put his whole project at risk. It helped that Buckler was a well-known Anglican. 
he managed to establish a good working relationship with the then Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple. It was also helpful that his deputy, Tutor Ede, was a leading nonconformist and lay preacher. None of this, however, cut any ice with the Roman Catholics, whose opposition was fierce and relentless. In the end, Butler effectively managed to buy them all off by agreeing that the state would pay for their schools, including the cost of repairing many inadequate buildings. He gave the churches the choice between having voluntary controlled schools where they got more funding but less control and voluntary aided schools where they got less funding but more control. He also allowed them to determine the nature of their school's daily acts of worship and their syllabuses for religious instruction, but with an opt-out right of withdrawal for any parents who might want it. Butler got what he wanted, a national system of schooling, albeit locally administered by local authorities, those originally established by the 1902 Education Act who would now have additional powers and be responsible for implementing the reforms. And the churches got what they wanted. They exchanged total control over education in their schools for more religious influence in all schools and moreover secured substantial state funding in the process. The Act said nothing about the curriculum to be taught, except with regard to religious education, which was the only compulsory subject prescribed. The legislation specified that the school day in every county school and in every voluntary school shall begin with collective <coughs> worship on the part of all the pupils. And then every local education authority was to be responsible for drawing up an agreed syllabus of religious instruction, which schools in its area would be required to follow. To help it in this process, legal power was given to constitute a Standing Advisory Council on Religious Education, a SACRE, the constitution of which was to reflect the principal tr religious traditions in the area. SACRES later became permanent bodies with legal powers as part of the 1988 Education Reform Act. The importance of the Butler Act is not just as a great historical landmark. Many of its provisions still shape the system of schooling in England and Wales today, in particular the continuing influence of churches and other religious organisations over schooling. I would like, like now to focus on the four main parameters of this continuing privileged influence. Firstly, the collective act of worship. The daily collective act of worship is still a legal requirement. The 1988 Educational uh, Reform Act added the proviso that such worship should be wholly or mainly of a broadly Christian character, which clearly does not reflect the diversity of beliefs in contemporary society. The fact that more than three quarters of secondary schools fail to comply with this legal requirement and are in, fact, in effect breaking the law every day and mostly with impunity itself suggests how outdated this has become. I would argue that the daily collective act of worship is a violation of the human rights of children. The school as an institution uses its authority to force children to worship and to pray. This is a form of indoctrination because when the child obediently puts her hands together and closes her eyes, she actually experiences nothing, only darkness and silence. But she is told by the authority figure that there is an invisible, all-powerful being watching and listening to her. She cannot test this assertion for herself, but she has no reason not to trust and believe what she is being told. There are good evolutionary reasons why children trust in whatever adults tell them. It has survival value. Daily sessions of prayer can convince a child over time that an omnipresent omnipotence really is there, and then the proselytisation is complete. Last year, two parents challenged the policy on collective worship of a school in the Oxford Diocesan Schools Trust. 
During assemblies, their child was obliged to pray, to act out biblical stories such as the crucifixion, and to hear Christian doctrine taught as truth. No meaningful alternative teaching was provided for children whose parents had exercised their right of withdrawal. In their submission to the High Court, the parents contended that the school policy constituted indoctrination and breached the right to freedom of belief under the Human Rights Act 1998 and the European Convention on Human Rights. The Diocesan Trust backed down. It agreed to provide alternative secular teaching for withdrawn pupils. But it is surely significant that the, the indoctrination claim went uncontested. More such challenges are needed. Schools are for teaching, not preaching. They may teach about religion, they should not teach how to be religious. It is a feature of British exceptionalism that the UK is the only Western democracy to impose worship in publicly funded schools by law. This law should now be abolished. Assemblies which play an important role in developing a sense of community and encouraging the social and moral development of pupils should be inclusive and respectful of all, regardless of religion or belief or non-belief. There have been many attempts to end collective worship. There is a growing consensus amongst educators, parents and academics on this, but governments always seem to have other priorities. Secondly, faith schools and schools with a religious character. In many ways, it is quite extraordinary that the churches and the religious bodies have retained their grip on exactly the same percentage of pupils in 2020 as they had in 1944, given the massive decline in church attendance and religious belief that has taken place over the past 75 years. In 1944, it was arguable that Britain was a Christian country, specifically an Anglican country. In 2020, it is not. In 2017, only 15% of the population identified as Anglican. Yet the church's privilege has been sustained by successive prime ministers of both political persuasions in the face of this huge cultural change. I would like to suggest that probably a majority of people in this country in 2020 would be sympathetic to the following propositions about faith schools. One, it is reasonable for parents to raise their children in a faith tradition if they so wish. It is not reasonable for them to expect the taxpayer to fund this. The European Convention on Human Rights guarantees parental rights to bring children up to be religious. It does not mandate the state to pay for it. Two, voluntary aided schools are able to teach confessional RE and have confessional collective worship. This should not happen as part of mainstream educational revision, but only be offered outside normal schooling. Three, the state has no business whatsoever supporting proselytisation of children or the inculcation of religious belief under any circumstances. Four, the state should not allow the existence of private faith schools, which in many instances deliberately resist British values and equality laws. Amanda Spielman, the head of Ofsted, made a speech in 2018 in which she reported on Ofsted's findings from such schools. She commented, we have found texts that encourage domestic violence and the subjugation of women. We have found schools in which there is a flat refusal to acknowledge the existence of people who are different. So, for example, lesbian, gay and bisexual people. Five. Relationships and sex education become compulsory in all secondary schools and relationships education compulsory in all primary schools this year. But faith schools are allowed to teach this in line with the religious background of pupils and the tenets of their own faith. They should not be. Six, education should not be organised around religious identity because it creates social division and segregation and undermines social cohesion. Seven, the existence of faith schools limits choice for parents who do not want a religious school for their children. 
about three in ten families find that all the closest primary schools to where they live have a religious character. 53% of all rural primary schools are faith schools. Eight, voluntary aided schools can impose religious criteria on 100% of pupil admissions and require potential teachers to pass a religious test. This is blatant discrimination and is unacceptable. It is worth noting in this regard that in 1944, under Butler's Act, the government paid 50% of the capital costs of voluntary aided schools. Now the government pays 90%. Faith schools only achieve marginally better academic results because faith-based selection actually in practice often means social selection benefiting middle class and more affluent parents. It has nothing to do with the religion. Finally, faith schools do not have a higher standard of morality teaching as is often claimed. All schools teach human, universal human moral values. In some instances, state-supported faith schools actually teach questionable values based on religious dogma, e.g. in relation to the rights of LGBT plus people. My conclusion is that if these propositions are uh, accepted, it follows that there should be no more state-funded schools with any kind of religious affiliation. Thirdly, the sacres. In essence, setting up the sacres and the locally agreed syllabuses of RE in 1944 was a political means of managing religious sectarianism to enable the educational reform that Butler wanted. In the context of his time, where internecine strife between the Christian denominations was rife, it was a stroke of political genius. He wouldn't have got his act through without it. Now it is a complete anachronism. The Sacres are still able to exert an important influence on religious education curricula. The Church of England has an automatic right to be re represented on all of these committees, despite church attendance being in free fall. Other representatives are supposed to reflect the principal religious traditions of the area. This is now, to say the least, a very bizarre idea. In 2017, a humanist parent challenged the Vale of Glamorgan Council over its refusal to allow a humanist representative to join the local Sacre. The chairperson of the National Association of Sacres, Mr Paul Smalley, supported this refusal. He reiterated the basic principle of the 1944 Act, saying, Membership of Sacres should reflect broadly the proportionate strength of the denomination or religion in the area. Therefore, it would seem that in deciding whether to appoint a humanist representative, an authority must satisfy itself that humanism is another religion, that it is part of the makeup of the principal religious traditions in the area, that humanist representation would reflect the strength of humanism in the area, and that the person has authority to represent that tradition. <coughs> so in essence, the humanists could be represented on this sacre if enough humanists live in the Vale of Glamorgan. Because what matters is that the RE curriculum reflect local circumstances. This is patently absurd. If humanism is worth teaching, it is because it is an important worldview which all children should know about. It should not depend on the happenstance of who lives where. Nobody would dream of doing this in any other subject. In mathematics, for example, would we teach decimals in Doncaster but not in Derby, or multiplication in Manchester but not in Mansfield? Local determination of the RE curriculum is ridiculous. It is also unfair and arbitrary. The sacres should be abolished and a national entitlement established, guaranteeing every pupil the same right to impartial and nationally agreed education in worldviews and belief. <laughs>
wherever they live. Finally, religious education. It is interesting to note that in the 1944 Education Act, religious education was to be the only prescribed subject on the curriculum. And when Margaret Thatcher and Kenneth Baker established the national curriculum in the 1988 Education Act, religious education was the only subject that was left out. This omission has allowed the 1944 postcode lottery of local determination of RE syllabuses to continue. What we need is for all children across the nation to be, sought, to, to be taught the same thing about religious uh, religions and worldviews, irrespective of local circumstances, as the National Secular Society's 21st Century RE for All campaign has been advocating for some time. Teaching children about the diversity of religions and uh, non-religious worldviews should be done in an impartial and equitable way which enables them to make their own minds up about it. This should be a universal common national entitlement for all pupils irrespective of where they live. All schools should be required to deliver this national entitlement curriculum and the quality of their provision should be inspected by Ofsted in the same way as is done for other subjects. Under these circumstances, there would be no need for a parental right of withdrawal and none should be available. There should be an end to section 48 inspections whereby religious bodies conduct inspections of religious education in their own schools. Not only is this marking your own homework, it is also costly and is the taxpayer who foots the bill. And there is some evidence that these inspections are used to pressure church schools into fostering a more religious ethos. In recent years, governments have become concerned about strengthening children's sense of national identity and their feeling of Britishness in the face of the multiplicity of world views now current in our multicultural pluralistic society. In Butler's time, the question of national identi identity was simpler and was closely tied up with the idea of the Church of England as the bastion of ethical values. The fostering of national identity in 1944 was presumed to be more or less synonymous with spiritual development and an understanding of Christian doctrine. Hence the unashamedly confessional nature of the religious instruction and worship that the 1944 Act promoted. We live in a different world now and issues surrounding national identity should become more clearly secular and focused on a form of civic education such as long, has long been the case uh, in other countries like France. France provides an interesting case study in how an education system reacts to serious incidents of religious conflict and violence. After the Charlie Hebdo Islamicist attack in January 2015, the response of the French government was to beef up the provision of enseignement moral et civique in all state schools. The curricular programmes developed were designed to instil the cultural values of liberty, equality and fraternity, as well as equipping pupils with a detailed understanding of the rights and responsibilities of citizens. Najat Valoud Belkacem, the Moroccan-born Minister for Women's Rights at the time, said, we have to appropriate the concept of laïcité so we can explain to our young pupils that whatever their faith, they belong to this idea and they are not excluded. Secularism is not something against them, it protects them. Laïcité is about saying we're a country where individuals can have whatever beliefs or lack of beliefs they choose and the public powers must be neutral towards them. The contrast with the situation in Britain could scarcely be greater. Despite our experience of similar terrorist incidents, the government has done little or nothing to address the ills of current arrangements for religious education and continues to promote the creation of ever more divisive faith schools. Instead of RE, what is needed is a civic education curriculum which develops the skills and understanding necessary for active citizenship, democratic participation in the political process, respecting the human rights of others,
appreciating the diversity of cultures and worldviews, engaging productively in moral debates, and understanding the importance of secularism. So, in conclusion, I would say that we have lived for far too long with the legacy of Buckler's 1944 Act. We need to ask, why is it any business of churches to be running our schools? For too long, we have had politicians who have simply assumed that it is normal and natural for religious bodies to exercise control in state-funded education. It is neither normal nor natural. There should be no more faith schools. The daily act of collective worship should be ended. The postcode lottery of local control of RE and the system of sacres should be abolished. It should be a national entitlement for all pupils to high-quality, non-partisan education about the diversity of world views. Any form of confessionalism or religious instruction should be separated and only ever take place in a voluntary non-state environment. We need a secular and inclusive system of education free from religious control. The 1944 Act was a great advance in state education for its time. But as we enter the third decade of the 21st century, real change is now urgently needed. Thank you.